Hey Church, thank you for taking a moment to listen to God's word today. Right now we are in a series of Mission Possible where we will get to know the heart of God more deeper for our church. Hope that this sermon will be a blessing to you and your family. There are four, three, um, there are four major buildings in architecture that absolutely shifted the history of of architecture really of civil these top four buildings basically were impossible to build but the designers of these architectures of this of this um, buildings these architectures they just designed something that the world would go like wow this has never been done before and uh, many of us we know those moments in history that there are so many moments in history that has said this has never been done before right um and many of us we have probably experienced it in our in our own lives i remember when i was uh, when we were newly married and my wife would be cooking and every week it's like wow this has never been done before And I'm still saying that this has never been done before, right? And many, many husbands and wives in your marriage, you have those experiences. Wow, she's never said that before. Oh, so kind. In business world, you try a lot of different things. And when you have a breakthrough, they say this has never been done before. Look at this first picture. This is... The Foundation Louis Vuitton. It's not a spelling mistake. That's how it is in French. And this was built in 2014 by Frank Gary in Paris. Beautiful building. Right? They looked at this building and they said that this can never be done. Basically, it's built in a vessel-shaped glass structure and it sits among the trees and lawns of Paris and it's... 126,000 square foot, 126,000 square foot, and two and a half story space. It's basically an art gallery. Basically, they built this building to put some pictures in a frame. <laughs> okay, next one. This is the Shanghai Tower that was built in 2015. The one in the middle that's really tall. That's the Shanghai Tower done by a guy called Gensler, designed and completed in 2015. It's about 200 and, uh, sorry, 2,073 feet tall, this Shanghai Tower. And uh, it has a lot of records. It's basically the tallest building in China, second tallest in the world. Uh, world's tallest observation deck, world's second fastest elevator system, okay? Um, And um, in comparison, they have saved, they they built this building basically in an asymmetrical form. As you can see, it's, you know, it's sort of like curved. It's not like a, a straight square. It's asymmetrical. And because of that, because the engineers structured it that way, the architecture designed it that way, they saved $58 million on material cost. They did not spend more. Because of the structure, they saved $58 million. Okay? In material cost. This building is also... But we didn't save any money. Um, (laughs) Right. Third one. 432 Park Avenue in New York. Built by this guy called Raphael. People looked at this building. In the architecture world, they said, this has never been done before. It's the tallest completed residential building. So that's basically apartments. Fully apartments. And, um, and, it deb- and it's located in the heart of Midtown Manhattan in New York. And uh, it's the tallest residential building ever. 
uh it has 1000 it is 1396 foot tall size skyscraper and it dominates the new york skyline basically this uh building is located in such a way that wherever that you travel around new york whether be it in car or train in airplane in any from any direction you can see it you can actually see it so it's done by an Uruguayan architect called Rafael Binoli, I think. That's how you pronounce it. So that's amazing. Next, next one. What is this? Anybody know? This is called the fruit salad bowl of California. Literally. This is the Apple um, Park, the headquarters of this company, Apple. So Apple Park is basically the final vision that, w that Steve Jobs had. And um, basically he was walking through the Hyde Park in, in London. And he looked at the park and he looked at the circular shape of the park. And he said, I want to have an office like this. So he ended up buying 175 acres of a big forest in California. And uh, he built this in circular form. And apparently, it's got um, some thousands of sensors across this building. And it's one of the most uh, energy, um, you know, uh, efficient building. It's got a lot of solar panels going there. So you should visit. Um, 60, the, the entire building maintains a 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. It doesn't matter what's the temperature outside. They have placed sensors in such a way that if, no matter where you walk, you have the same degree. Uh, happens in Trichy as well during summer. You just walk out. It maintains 38 to 40 degrees. We have several sensors in this city that helps that to happen. The campus also houses 9,000 trees. So those 9,000 trees is just in the inside part. So the outside had um, the forest area that already existed. But these 9,000 trees, they're all fruit trees that was planted by apple in the middle part. And they're all mostly apples, <laughs> actually, plum, apricot, and other fruit trees, basically. And that's why it's called the fruit salad bowl of California. I mean, people have no idea what to do with money, eh? They just, it's awesome. So basically, they look at it and they said, this has never been done before. Does that excite you? These buildings, do they excite you? Yeah? It's really fascinating, right? Fascinating to see what human can do. Now, let me tell you an interesting thing that happened. Um, the Jewish people and the Roman people, they saw something like never before in their lives. And the Romans especially designed something that they thought would never change its meaning. But something happened like never before that what they designed and the purpose that they designed for, it totally changed its meaning. Let's have the next picture. The cross. Romans designed the cross. The cross was designed for criminals to be hung on it and for them to feel the maximum pain that they could ever feel before they die because that's the way of punishment that they wanted to give they never thought in history that this cross that they designed which meant death which meant end it meant uh, punishment would historically be placed across every single building that is called the church as a symbol of hope and new life. 
never been done before. Like never before. So it's important for us to understand that in history there has been a never before intervention, a never before moment which was not done by any humankind but it was done by the divine God. And that divine God who stepped out from heaven came to earth and he wanted to redeem his creation like never before. He died on the cross, the very cross that people thought that's the end. That's it. There is no hope after this. The very people who thought that, that death is the end of everything. Nobody saw resurrection coming. And Jesus gave hope to humanity like never before. He healed the sick like never before. He restored the brokenhearted like never before. And the same Jesus can bless you, can lead you, can change your life, can heal you, can set you free can raise up this church, can restore this world, can save this world, this nation, like never before. Somebody shout amen. 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 This is what the cross meant for the Romans, for the Jewish people. But they never imagined in history that it will change its meaning. They never imagined that people will have the cross like... You know, people would be scared to look at the cross at those times. It was in Calvary, place filled with skull and place filled with death and place filled with darkness. And now that's the very symbol of hope and new life. They never thought of that. Throughout history, many people are doing great things that people never thought of. But there is something that God has already done that we could never think of that He gave His only Son on the cross to die and through His blood our sins are washed away. Nobody has ever thought of that and there are still people who are not thinking about it. I've titled the sermon this morning like never before. If we come together, we will see something like never before. Today is the last Sunday for this series, Mission Possible. And I want to end this series with this thought. What can God do among us now like never before? If we come together in unity, if we come together with one heart, with one mission, if we come together to say, God, do something like never before, what would that look like? Amen? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, God is going to do something like never before. God is going to do something like never before. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. Let's all read together, shall we? In the last days, God says, I said let's all read together, let's do it. 3, 2, 1, go. God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. If we need to see missional church, then we need to create. That is not in the verse. Where did that come from? <laughs> the verse ends there. I think he just went to get. He added something extra to the verse. Thank you, Kenneth. In the last days, God will pour out, my, pour out my spirit upon all people like never before. Can this be our prayer? Can this be our prayer? Can this be our heart? The first thing that we need to do if we need to see God move like never before is we need to pray like never before. That's the first thing we need to do. Nehemiah 1.4 When I heard this, I sat down and wept 
In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and prayed to God of heaven. When Nehemiah heard that his city is broken, that Jerusalem has no walls, it has no protection, that people are dying, he sat down, he cried, he prayed unto God like never before. And you look throughout those verses in chapter 1, uh, after verse 4, it's completely the prayer of Nehemiah. That, that's how it starts. We all talk about how Nehemiah built the wall. But if you read the first chapter, he, before he built the wall, he started with a prayer. Can we pray like never before? If we need to experience God in our lives, if we need to experience these greater days, because in, according to Acts 2.17, God is going to pour out a fresh spirit upon all generations. Upon all generations. And in the last days, we are going to see a great harvest like never before. There's going to be a big sweep of people who are going to give their life to Jesus like never before. Somebody shout amen. amen. It's going to happen. But how will it happen? Only when we as a church start praying like never before. Your view of God influences how you pray to Him. If you don't have this missional view, then you will not have a missional prayer lifestyle. You see, when Jesus was feeding the 5,000, it says that from the mountain, He looked at the people. And He said, where can we get food for them all? But the disciples were also with Jesus and they did not see the people and the compassion that Jesus had. They did not share the same compassion that Jesus had. They are all in the same point. They all had the same view. They all had the same scene in front of them. But Jesus had a compassionate heart while others were trying to reason with Jesus. They are saying like if, if you know we can't feed them even if we worked for an entire year and brought our entire salary to you it's still not going to be enough to feed them the other one said look at this little kid who's got a, some bread and some fish and that's all we have how are you going to feed everybody it was a passover meal they are supposed to happen in a small group but jesus had a different view because he is the church is not about just a small number of people just enjoying the cozy comfortable christian lifestyle just encouraging one another just praying for each other and we're just in the same circle god wants to expand our territories he wants us to see the way he sees he wants to have compassion for hundreds and thousands of people when will that happen? When we ask. When we pray like never before. The question is, are you desperate and persistent in prayer, asking God for a harvest like never before? Are you praying every morning before you come into church, Lord, I don't want to see an empty seat next to me, Lord. Are we praying those prayers? Or is it just me praying that? Can we start praying that from next Sunday onwards? That we don't see an empty seat next to us. Because God will bring somebody. The least that we can do is pray. Desperately pray. Persistently pray. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. If you need to pray like never before, you need to pray with a heart of faith. Amen? When you pray with a heart of faith, you will see God move in and through our lives and in the church. So it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists. This has to be our view about God. If we need to pray like before, like never before, then we need to have this view about God that our God is a great God and He exists. What does he mean by exist? It means that he is alive, he's able to speak to us, he's able to listen to us, and he's actively participating when you pray. Come on, somebody. He's not just a statue where you sit and you pour milk on him. He's not just a statue that just sits and doesn't talk back. 
He's a living God. He's a great I am. So when you pray, you know, the author says that you must believe that God exists, which means that when you pray, you must believe that you have a God who sits with you in your prayer. That he listens to your prayer. He participates in your worship. He participates in your thanksgiving. He participates and he is listening to every need. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's our God. That's our God who exists. There are many God they claim that that they exist. (laughs) There's too many gods. We have millions of God and they all claim they exist. In fact, we've got too many God-men in India. Human beings, men who are claiming that they are gods. And people got pictures of them. People going in thousands to worship them. And yet we find it hard to fill the seats in the church where we represent the living God. Why is that? What is our view of God? They all claim that God exists. And do they exist like the way our God exists? They don't. The true and living God. And it says that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. When you have the right view about God, you start praying desperate prayers, persistent prayers, and you will pray like never before. And what happens is that God will reward for your prayers. And reward is, can also be the lost people. The ones who are broken. The ones who are not yet saved. And you see, you share the good news, you pray for them, and they get baptized. That's a reward for the kingdom of God. Amen. And we earnestly, sincerely seek Him. You know, the disciples are asking, how do we pray to Jesus? And let's go to Luke chapter 11. If you got your Bibles. Luke chapter 11 from verse 5 to 10. Then teaching them more about prayer, Jesus used this story. He says, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit. And I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom and says, Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give to you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. I love that. That's what we need if we need to pray like never before. If you're going to pray for the lost people, if you're going to pray, Lord, I want to see a greater harvest like never before. We want to see thousands of people get saved and be baptized. I'm dreaming of a day where one Sunday from morning to evening we are doing only baptisms because thousands of people are saved. Only baptisms. Put out some 50 tanks. People come in, dip out, dip out, dip out. I wanted to make it headlines. I wanted to go to the central government. That's okay. That's okay. Look what the Lord is doing. When will that happen? When you shamelessly persist. (laughs) That's what Jesus said. He says, he's telling a story. If you go and knock in the middle of the night. Now when Jesus says middle of the night and they are sleeping, you got to understand those times, they start sleeping when the sun goes down. They did not have electricity like we had now. They did not have Wi-Fi where they watch Netflix till 12 o'clock and waiting for somebody to knock at their door. That doesn't happen. They probably started sleeping by 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. So they're already in through the sleep. So when Jesus says middle of the night, for them it's probably around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. And and when they come and knock, can you imagine? I mean, you would hate when somebody knocks at your door at 2 a.m. 
And this person comes and knocks. And, he, and here is the thing. Watch this. Watch this. Here's the thing. He's saying, don't go and ask for food for yourself. Suppose you say that a friend has arrived to your house and you're asking food for him. You're not asking in prayer for your own meal. You're asking in prayer for somebody else who doesn't have something. Church, we need to wake up. We have been so long praying for me and me and myself, my plate, my bank account, my house, my family. But this is not about that. This he's saying, go and wake up a friend for another friend who doesn't have something and this guy's in the middle. Pray like never before. And Jesus says, <laughs> I love that verse. You know, he says, he, at, the, at first he will say, don't bother me, don't disturb me. But then he will come and help you simply because you're shameless and you won't just leave until he gives you something. So just to get rid of you, he'll try to give at least something. Now that's a human nature that God is talking about. What we need to take from that is that can we be shamelessly persistent in praying for the lost souls? Basically, swallow your own pride, swallow your own ego, put aside the list of needs that you have for yourself and your family and shamelessly ask for the lost. Can somebody say amen? Because it says, and so I tell you, Jesus continues, keep on asking. Keep on asking. Every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day, keep on asking, Lord, can you use me to save somebody today? Can I share the good news with somebody today? Can you shamelessly ask God for that? Lord, can I meet somebody who's really, really broken today that I can just say Jesus loves you, there's hope for your life and tell them my story? Can we be shamelessly persistent about that? It says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking the door and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. For everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks the door, it shall be open. For so long, we have been, for so long, we have been just using that verse in the church. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive. Whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, we have been preaching that. But we didn't preach the first part of that prayer. We have put this verse always in the context of blessing. We've always put this in the context of, of, of getting something for ourselves. But Jesus did not say that verse in the context of our own blessing at all. He's talking about a man who is actually standing in the gap for somebody else who doesn't have something. There are so many lost souls out there who still are living without Jesus in their lives, without knowing the name Jesus, without hope in their lives. Their eyes are still not yet open. So many people are still dying without Jesus. One thing that really broke my heart during COVID is not that many are dying, many are dying without Jesus. That was the greatest pain. People will die. Anyway, they'll die with COVID, without go, uh, COVID. That's just inevitable. Like you can't escape death as human. But the, the crazy part was that so many so quickly died without getting to know Jesus. Did that break your heart? What are we doing? How are we responding? Our lifestyle needs to change. Can we shamelessly persist for the lost? For the lost. Here's number two. Engage like never before. Engage like never before. If you want to see a breakthrough, if you want to see a harvest like never before, 
we need to start engaging with people like never before. We need to engage with the community like never before. We have to love them like never before. How can you engage with the lost? Only through the love of Jesus. Only if you carry that passion, the heart of compassion, and, and you're ready to show God's love at all cost. At all cost. You cannot talk about, G, about God's love without mentioning the name Jesus and without talking about the cross. Today many people claim that they share the good news to many and they try to be diplomatic. They try to, uh, try to be decent or they, they don't want to offend somebody by saying the name Jesus. And they try to you know, compose songs without the name Jesus and try to use it. In the, okay, there are, there are different tools, but somewhere we need to say the name Jesus. Somewhere we need to say God is real, his name is Jesus, his blood is all powerful, he died on the cross for you, he rose again on the third day, and because of that, you have new life and freedom. We got to talk about Jesus. Are you ready to do that? Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Write this down. You can't talk about love without mentioning the cross and the name of Jesus. Romans 1.16, it says, for, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Jesus Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. It's interesting. It's interesting that he says the Jew first and also the Gentile. The Jew first and also the Gentile. You have two kinds of people in this world. The ones who believe in God, but they're after the wrong God. That's the Gentiles. And then there are ones who know that the true God exists, but they ignore him, the Jews. They ignored the Messiah. And today also we have the Jews and the Gentiles here in our society, in our communities, you have people who have not yet met God and they have a belief about God, but they're just following the wrong God, wrong ideologies. They just don't know who the true God is. And then you have the other ones who are leaving God behind. Today, the greatest religion is atheism. The ones who don't believe that God does not, the ones who believe that God does not exist. And they confidently say, there's no God. And it's, they're increasing by every second in this world. The Jews and the Gentiles. People who have not met God before, we need to reach them. And we should also talk to the ones who are leaving God behind. I was talking to a couple of young people and they were saying, this happened a few years back, they says, oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm an atheist. I said, how can you be a Christian and an atheist? I'm a Christian atheist. I'm like, that's impossible. And basically, they're saying, by, by, na by name, I'm a Christian. My name is Matthew. By name, I'm a Christian. I was born in a Christian family, but I don't believe in God. I follow the tradition because that's all there is. So I'll attend the church if my family wants me to. I'd go to funerals. I'll go to weddings. I can even pick up a Bible and read it because that's what my family wants me to do. It's just a tradition for us so that we'll keep the peace in the family. But I don't believe God exists. For me, there's no belief. I have no faith. A Christian atheist, can you imagine? It's terrible. It's terrible. There are a lot of Christian atheists sitting inside the church also. You can do things traditionally. You can follow Jesus traditionally because you're in church. 
and if you don't have faith and belief in the living God you're pretty much like an atheist if you don't have a relationship with the living God you're pretty much living like an atheist there's no difference between them and you the only thing is you're much more complicated than them how can the church be alive with such people how can we take the mission forward with such mindset how can we reach the lost it's important we pray like never before you have no idea what we are going to face with the next generation the only thing every morning i pray for zion is that lord let her just worship you like we worship you let her just follow you i don't pray for education i don't pray for a career i don't pray what she's going to do when she grows up i care the least about that all of that god will take care they are smart enough to make those choices for themselves but if they don't have god in them you just i'm a fourth generation christian and lo- lose the fifth one does that bother you does that bother your heart does that does that disturb your sleep so many nights i've been disturbed and i just wake up and i lay my hands on her and i just pray god i just want her to worship you that's all i want for her that she will always keep claiming jesus is the true god that's all i want and i can shamelessly pray for that and not just for my daughter for many other daughters who are out there many other sons who are out there many people who are around us we need to pray we need to pray it's on us it's on us and we have to engage with them when you do this when you pray like never before and when you engage with people with love like never before the third thing will happen that is you will experience jesus like never before in your own life in your own life you will see things you will walk through things you will experience the work of the holy spirit in your life like never before like never before as you pray and engage like never before you will experience things you will see god move you will see miracles happening in your own life like never before i don't know how many of you have truly heard this only god knows but i want to give this time into god's hand we're going to just close in prayer god has spoken to us for the past for the past four uh, you know three sundays and today is the fourth sunday today is the fourth sunday we looked at the week 1 missio day the mission of god the jesus god triune god you know you can't just separate them the mission of god and the image of god is the same it's the same today god spoke to us about like never before in the last days he will pour out his spirit he will do something in your life through your careers through your jobs through this church he will do something like never before but the word is that can you shamelessly pray and ask for it for the next generation can we swallow our pride can we swallow our ego can we swallow our needs and put the lost in front of us last week uncle richard spoke who are you or i mean it's where are you there are so many things that is happening in the world where are we with missions and he point out few verses that that should really disturb us and he lo- showed us so many missionaries thousands more than 2.5 lakhs of young people who stepped out of england to come to to go into various parts and corners of the world for the sake of the gospel india has 70% of our total population are young people did you know that 
we can we are capable of sending millions of missionaries millions who is asking for it to god who is asking to god about it is anybody believing god for that is anybody shamelessly asking god for that lord i want to see millions of missionaries going into the ends of the earth all across this world from this nation india and i want to see that in my lifetime is anybody asking god for that can we ask god for that it's important we do that it's important we do that we too we heard it's our family thing how we need to be a a missional family we learned that all these four sermons i want you to take it in your heart and i want you to commit to that as a church that we will be part of the mission of god that we will be missional families that we will not be lost among the lost we will stand out for the mission of god and that we will pray like never before seek him like never before engage with god's people like never before and experience Jesus like never before. Hope that this sermon is a blessing to you and your family. If you would like to support our ministry, please log on to kingcitychurch.org forward slash give. Hope to see you next week with a new inspiring sermon.